Hello everyone. Today we're looking at the timeline of events which led to the first Chimlinga War. This was a two-year battle which took place from 1896 to 1897 between the British and the Zimbabweans. The war was a result of Zimbabwe's resistance to the British colonization and the harsh conditions they were forced to live with in their own country. For us to understand what really led to this war and what Britain was actually doing in Zimbabwe, we have to go way back in history. This video is part of a four-part series on the history of Zimbabwe. We will be releasing a video each week, so make sure you don't miss a new episode by clicking on the subscription button below and the notification bell. If you're not familiar with this beautiful nation, it's a country located in the southern region of Africa, landlocked by South Africa, Zambia, Mozambique and Botswana. It gained its independence from the British in 1980 after a hundred years of colonization. Zimbabwe is home to one of the world's natural wonders, the Great Victoria Falls. It is also famous for its large stone structures and in terms of resources, it has rich farming soil and perfect weather for farming. Maize, wheat, sugar, mostly grain crops. It was actually known as the Great Basket of Africa at some point in history. The country is also rich in a number of minerals, gold included. Here is a fun fact. It is also home to some international celebrities like Denai Gurira. Scratch that. Media has to get it right. Danai Gurira, who played one of the leading roles in Marvel's Black Panther. And Kesti Kovacic, seven-time swimming Olympic champion. And the list goes on. I only mentioned a few which you might have a good chance of knowing. Now back to our history. 1882, the exploration of Africa. By 1882, the Europeans had already begun exploring Africa and claiming land for themselves. The greatest European influence was found in two areas at the time, the Cape Colony and the Free State. The Cape Colony was formed when a bunch of Europeans ditched their African expedition after discovering the tip of Southern Africa. This is some good weather, lads. Let's settle. Yippee! Is that gold I see there, John? The Congo Free State was controlled by Belgium. It was created with the goal of establishing a trade monopoly in Africa. They exploited ivory, minerals, timber and labor. Problem. The Free State was the center of Africa and Belgium essentially cut off free trade from the south and north of Africa. This sparked some friction with Britain, France and Germany who were already settled in Africa and used their African settlements to market their Western goods and to exploit African natural resources which fueled their growing industries in their own countries. Belgium's existence in Central Africa was disturbing this. 1885, the scramble for Africa at the Berlin Conference. To protect the interests of Germany, the first Chancellor of Germany Otto von Bismarck organized a meeting to divide Africa amongst European countries. They drew up African borders which exist till this day. However, Africans were not invited to this meeting and they were never consulted about this. And yet the impact of this conference plays a huge role in the political and economic state of Africa today. During the Berlin Conference, they deliberately curved up Africa into mostly small countries which could be easily overpowered and dominated. The aim was to divide and conquer. The Portuguese and the British divided Southern Africa amongst themselves. The British were in Botswana, South Africa, Zambia, Malawi and Zimbabwe. Africa is still trying to break free from the post-colonial grip of European countries. For example, France coerced its former colonies into signing the Pact for Continuation of Colonization. Experts argue that this pact limits the financial freedom of African countries as it mandates that 50% of the country's reserves should be lodged with the Reserve Bank of France, hence restricting a country's freedom to utilize its own resources and invest as and when it sees fit. 
In 2019, Chihombori Kuo, former ambassador of the African Union to the United States, highlighted that France takes over 500 billion from African countries based on a pact which they forced African countries to sign before they were granted independence. 1888, the Rad Concession. After the Berlin Conference, the British did not waste time and immediately began strategizing a way of colonizing the southern region of Africa, including Zimbabwe. A trio of cunning British negotiators, Rochford Maguire, Francis Thompson, the language interpreter, and Charles Rand, the leader of the trio, set on a mission to Zimbabwe to negotiate a trade agreement between the British and the Zimbabweans. At this point in time, there were two well-known ethnic groups in Zimbabwe, the Ndebele in Matebele land and the Shona in Mashona land. King Lobengula was the leader of the Matebele land. On arrival, the British trio had to wait for a full month before meeting with King Lobengula as he was reluctant to meet with them. Determined as they were, they implemented a number of things to complete their mission successfully. The trio bribed a close ally of Lobengula, a missionary named Charles Helm. They also brought in another missionary, John Moffat, who was mainly known because of his father's reputation, Robert Moffat, to assist them in negotiating and influencing Lobengula to view the trio in a favorable manner. What you have to understand is Christian missionaries had already settled in some parts of Africa and were known as good and trustworthy people who brought the message of God. They were trusted by kings and queens. If the trio could get them on their side, they too would receive the same respect from African leaders. It is rumored that Moffat was not aware of the trio's hidden agenda to exploit the country's minerals and their colonial interests. All he knew was that this was a friendship between two countries. The trio also bribed two of Lobengula's indunas, meaning generals, Loshte and Skombo. What were they bribed with? Alcohol and other items, which were very foreign to them at this point in time. In return, Loshte and Skombo were to lie during translations between the trio and Lobengula and assist in persuading Lobengula into signing an agreement. After a month of all sorts of trickery and deceitful tactics, Lobengula began negotiations which led to the signing of what is known as the Rad Concession. This document sealed the fate of Zimbabwe as a British colony at this point in time. The British were granted ownership of all metals and minerals in the country and could do whatever they wanted to extract the minerals from the ground. The greatest misconception about King Lobegula is that he was a weak leader who simply signed the country over to Britain because of some sweets, sugar and alcohol. And this is how he is portrayed in contemporary literature. He was actually a great and powerful leader who had the best interests of his people at heart. He had the strongest army in the country at the time, and this is because the Demele were descendants of the Zulu people from South Africa. They had the best war tactics, which made use of the prominent short spear and shield. Lobengula was seen as the strongest opposition to Britain's colonial interests in Zimbabwe. This explains why Rhodes approached him to discuss the future of Zimbabwe, despite the fact that Matebeleland constituted less than half of the country. The terms of negotiations were never fully explained to the king. The document was written in a foreign language, English. Hence, he could not read the terms. Verbally, he was promised so many things for his people, including European medicine, firepower, and a trade friendship with Britain. The trio even lied about their intentions behind their interests in Zimbabwe. When King Lobengula realized what he'd actually signed and agreed to, he was furious. He killed one of his indunas and sent representatives to the queen to explain that he had not agreed to sign away his country. The queen's response was anything but helpful as she told him, 
A king gives away a cow, not the whole herd. Upon return to Britain, the three negotiators, Rochford Maguire, Francis Thompson, and Charles Rand, were knighted as they had acquired land for the British Empire. 1889, the launch of the British South Africa Company. In 1889, the British South Africa Company was formed to administer the effective occupation of Southern Africa by the British, to act as the police force which would help to develop settlements for European settlers. Again, the Africans were not consulted in these colonial processes. The company was owned by a British man, Cecil John Rhodes. It began by operating in South Africa and later moved on to Zimbabwe with the Rudd concession in hand to show their claim on the land. This was known as the Pioneer Column. 1890, the Pioneer Column. The Pioneer Column was led by Cecil John Rhodes, the owner of the British South Africa Company. Under this company, the British migrated from South Africa to Zimbabwe. As they traveled, they would hoist the British flag in certain areas to symbolize colonialism. This was done in Fort Victoria, now known as Mashingo, in Fort Chata, now known as Chivu, and in Salisbury, now known as Harare. They named the country Rhodesia after Cecil John Rhodes. As soon as the British settled, they began practicing agriculture and searching for minerals. Initially, they were welcomed by the people and were only seen as traders. They were even welcomed by Mbuyane Handa, a great spiritual leader for the Shona people. She was a spirit medium, Shikiro, and she channeled a royal female ancestral spirit named Nehanda. She was well respected by King Lobengula and had great influence in the region. She occupied an important and influential position in the religious hierarchy in Mashonaland. She is actually the only recorded woman known to have held such a significant position during the 19th century. Eventually, this welcome was strained as the British continuously increased in number and forced the natives to relocate as they occupied the land of their choice, for instance, good farming land. And they forced the natives to work in their fields and workshops by imposing taxes on them, which were known as the hard tax. To create manual labor, to build new towns, railways, and work in rapidly developing mines, they imposed a tax on each household payable in money, labor, grain, or stock, and was highly beneficial to colonial authorities. The British also did not acknowledge or recognize pre-existing political structures in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabweans began resenting the British. Nehanda, with the help of another medium, Kaguri, openly pointed out that the cause of all their problems was the white man. They also spread the message that God had decreed that the white man should be driven out of the country, that the people had nothing to fear because God would turn their bullets into water. For people who were used to fighting with spears and crossbows, firepower was the white man's unfair advantage, so they held back on starting a war. 1895, the Jemison Raid. Meanwhile in South Africa, the British claimed they were being mistreated by the Boers. The Boers were Dutch settlers who had arrived in the Cape Colony in the 1600s and claimed the same land the British were after. The British South Africa Company sought to mend this by enforcing their rule in South Africa via their police force. This was known as the Jemison Raid. But the raid was a complete flop as the British were received by a prepared Boer army and they immediately got defeated and imprisoned. Rhodes was forced to resign as the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony and was on the verge of losing the British South Africa Company. When the Ndebele in Mantebeleland heard the news that the British South Africa Company had been defeated, 
they realized that the white man was not invincible. They too could fight the British South Africa company and win. On top of this, only 40 soldiers remained in Rhodesia. The rest had left for the Jamison raid in South Africa. So it was a good time to attack the settlers and drive them off once and for all. With Nehanda, Kagui, and Mukwati leading the resistance for the Zimbabwean people, a rebellion was initiated in Zimbabwe. This kick-started the battle known as the First Chimringa War in 1896. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it informative. Don't forget to leave a like and stay tuned for part 2, the First Chimringa War.